let's turn to our Bible passage reading this morning, which is Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learnt that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then Jesus turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I've come into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman... From the time I've ended, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say amongst themselves, who is it that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Father God, as we look at your word now, I pray that you may speak into our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Six weeks ago, we commenced a new series that's taken us up to Christmas. It is about the different encounters that Jesus had with various people, particularly through the eyes of Dr. Luke. So far, we've learnt about Simeon's encounter with the baby Jesus in Luke chapter 2 and how the Spirit of God prompted him to know that this baby was the one, the Redeemer of Israel. We also saw the encounter that the prophet Anna had with this baby Jesus and how after years of waiting and waiting on God that he came through and that she got to see this promised Messiah through her encounter with Jesus. We looked also at two different people, both of whom were controlled by various demons, one who was mentioned in chapter 4 and the other in chapter 8 of Luke's Gospel. Both these men who had endured such a, a hard life encountered Jesus and experienced powerful healings. A couple of weeks ago, we were reminded of Levi's encounter with Jesus. And because of that encounter that he had with Jesus, Matthew, Levi who became Matthew, became a follower of Jesus and ended up writing a gospel about his Lord, which has impacted generations Last week, Andrew shared with us from Luke 7 about a Roman centurion who had enough faith to seek out Jesus, even though he didn't feel worthy to, to even talk to, to Jesus. And so Jesus honoured this man's faith. This morning, we are looking at another beautiful encounter that Jesus had between a lonely, sinful woman of the city of Capernaum and the forgiveness that he offered her. Well, Jesus seemed to have friends in different sections of society. In in Capernaum, there was a prominent Pharisee by the name of Simon, who invited him to come over to his place to have dinner. For some reason, Simon's welcome of Jesus when he arrived was kind of very casual, if not a little bit discourteous. 
He supplied no water to wash the, the dust from his sandaled feet. As you know, the roads were, were very dusty back in those days. There was no kiss of welcome, as was the custom. And there was no anointing of the head with oil or feet with ointment, as happened for important guests back in those days. The meal was eaten in the normal Eastern fashion with the host guests reclining on couches around the table, resting their head on their left hand while eating from their right. One strange custom, although not uncommon at all, was the passing of people in the street who would often come into the house, the open house, and would watch what was happening. So what was like a a private dinner actually became quite a, a public dinner. Therefore, it wasn't unusual for a woman to step inside from outside and to watch what was happening. We'd like us just to try and imagine, because we just read these words and just and don't quite understand what's happening. I'd like you to watch this woman, um, for this woman. For a while, she comes in and she's hardly noticeable as she passes uh, presses against the wall, perhaps with other people next to her as they watch on what was happening at this dinner. Then suddenly she moves. She comes behind Jesus and kneels down at his feet and draws a costly jar of perfume from her dress. As she prepares to pour it gently over his feet, tears start to well up in her eyes. She's greatly embarrassed as the tears fall on the feet of Jesus. And so she lets down her long hair, something that a respectable woman would not do in those days. And she quickly wipes away her tears from the feet of Jesus. By this time, all present were very conscious of what was happening here. And Simon, the Pharisee, he's absolutely shocked. And he mutters to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. Now Simon, according to his law, he knew that this this shouldn't be happening. And he states, and the law states that a prophet would prevent, a prophet would prevent a sinner from touching him because touching him from a sinful person would make that prophet Ritually unclean. And after Simon had muttered to himself, then came a a rebuke. Jesus said to Simon that he had something to tell him, according to verse 40. I wonder if just for a moment Simon was thinking, I wonder what Jesus is going to say to me. After all, I did invite Jesus into my house. Jesus, though, was about to teach Simon a lesson. Jesus started by giving an illustration about two men who had debts with a banker. A lot of us here have debts that we owe to the banker. One owed the bank 500 silver pieces, the other just 50. Neither of them could pay up. And so the banker, according to what Jesus said, decided to cancel both their debts. Now, wouldn't that be nice, hey? And this is what Jesus was saying, that the banker decided to cancel, to wipe the debts of both people. Jesus then asked which of the two would be more grateful. And Simon replied that he thought that it would be the one who owed the most. And so Jesus said, yep, you're right, in verse 43. Then Luke tells us that Jesus turned to the woman that's still talking to Simon. And he said this in verses 44 to 47, I come into your house, Simon. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I've entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven 
as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Still looking at this woman. Maybe she was a bit calmer by now. Probably wondering what was going to happen. And Jesus speaks these words to her. He said, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We know virtually nothing of this woman from Capernaum except one thing, that she lived a sinful life in that town. Somehow most scholars believe that she was a prostitute. Somehow she had been drawn into this most seedy of lifestyles. But maybe she was starting to become sick of it all. Sick of herself, sick of the sin that she was living. Many people, particularly Christians, who somehow attempted into sexual sin, get sick of it all. Can get sick of themselves. Sick of their sin. Jesus had an amazing attitude towards the sin of the flesh. Under no circumstances does he condone impurity. Indeed, his teaching goes beyond the outward action. He looks at the heart and says in Matthew 5 verse 28, he says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Yet Jesus often showed deep understanding and sympathy with those who have fallen into sensual sin. He knew that sex was created by God, that it is good if we keep it within the boundaries of a husband and a wife. Many go outside of these boundaries and end up hurt and scarred. Believe me, they do. Jesus showed deep understanding and sympathy with those who have fallen into sensual sin. He says to those who are truly repentant, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The woman of Capernaum was truly repentant and sorry for her life of sin. This was shown by her tears. She had had it. She needed forgiveness and a new life. And Jesus granted this. What a beautiful encounter that resulted in confession and forgiveness. The coming of the woman was the search of a stained, sinful life for pardon. Gloriously, forgiveness was received and she left in peace. So many need to have such an encounter with Jesus like this. They know that their life is stained by sin. Such an encounter with Jesus can lead to pardon and forgiveness and peace. Jody Cadman is a New Zealander who came to live in Sydney. Jody never forgot her mother's words, which she heard, overheard when she was just six years old. It was the end of her first year at school. The day was hot and Jodie slipped from outside inside for a drink. She was at the fridge in the kitchen when she realised that her mother was talking to her neighbour in the next room. She heard her mother say how she couldn't bear touching Jodie and how she wishes she'd never had a girl. Jodie couldn't move. In a few seconds, her whole world had changed. She just huddled, white face shaking against the wall, trying not to cry. She hardly heard anything else her mother was saying. There was something about a a baby boy that was still born. She 
shakenly tiptoed outside. She climbed an old tree and just cried and cried and cried until there was no more tears. Eventually it got dark and cool outside. And so she went inside for tea. Nobody seemed to notice just how quiet she was. The hurt grew inside her and she began to hate both her parents, saying, how dare her mother not love her? She noticed more and more how she hugged her brothers. The mother hugged her brothers and not her. She craved the same affection, would run up to her mother, but her mother would push her away. And so when she became a teenager, she fled her country for the bright lights of Sydney. When she was a street kid, Jodie said this, I feel as if I am desperately searching for something and I don't even know what I'm searching for. Maybe it's happiness or love, I don't know. Nothing satisfies me. I still feel hollow, frighteningly hollow. There's something missing, something important. Perhaps if I ever found it, I'll know what life was all about and what point was in it all. Street workers, Charlie and Jill, reached out to her and prayed with her. Charles said to her how God wants to forgive her mother for everything that she did and everything that she didn't do. Jodie's fist, though, was still clenched with familiar anger, and she blurted out, why the hell should I? She doesn't deserve to be forgiven. She doesn't care whether I forgive her or not. Then she gradually reached a stage in her life where she wanted God to deal with her feelings of rejection. Charles explained a very important biblical principle. He said, God cannot do much with us unless we release our revengeful grip on those who hurt us. And when Jodie released her hate towards her mother, she said this, I felt an enormous weight lifted off me. I felt strangely warm and peaceful inside like I've never felt before. Over a period of time, she met a number of Christians who knew that peace. It wasn't easy for Jodie to discover that peace. But she wrote in this book, I love being alive. I just, it's just so good being able to live peacefully with myself and with other people. I'm at peace with God. The anger's gone out of me. I didn't want to live most of my life. I was running away and searching. I'm glad to be alive now. I just want to thank Jesus for giving me life. This is what God's forgiveness is all about. Releasing you from your hang-ups, from your sins, from your bad thoughts, your wrongful desires to a life of freedom and peace. In the book of Romans, Paul shares with us about life before Christ and life after Christ. And he said, you have been set free from sin. During 1963 in Australia, a remarkable book was published. It was a story of a man by the name of John Natchbull, Natchbull, who was sent from England to Australia in 1824 as a convict. After incredible experiences of cruelty and suffering, he was finally executed for murder before 10,000 people in Darlinghurst in Sydney in 1844. But as he laid awaiting his execution, Don Nashbull wrote his life story. And it was only about 50 years ago, after all these years, has his manuscript been discovered. It has allowed, it has allowed a new estimate of life and condemnations of one of the most uh, notorious criminals in Australia's early history. Well, John, it now appears, was falsely and savagely sentenced to transportation to Australia at the instigation of one of his relatives. In Sydney, he was forced to endure the suffering and cruelty of those really bitter days back then. He was even sent further away to Norfolk Island, which was the penalty given to convicts who were sentenced for further acts of defiance at the, 
as a convict in those early days in Sydney. On return, though, to Sydney, the injustice and the cruelty that he had suffered welled up, leading him to commit a ruthless murder. And it was for this crime that he was publicly hung. It was during his final trial and the days when he was awaiting death that John's story became a wonderful story of redemption. A Christian woman, a Mrs. Latham, attended John's trial. As he was taken back from the courthouse to his cell, she seized the opportunity for which she had planned. She was able to say to him quietly and sincerely, make your peace with the Almighty God. Well, back in his cell, John could not get that kindness of the woman's face or her genuine, intense words out of his mind. It was almost the first tender act that he had received in years. He sent for Mrs. Latham and she came together with her minister from the Pitt Street Congregational Church in Sydney. They talked to him of the love and forgiveness of God. Then it happened. Pardon. Salvation broke into this man's heart. He wrote this. No tongue can express my feelings until I flew to prayer and meditated on the advice given to me by Mrs. Latham. Make your peace with God. Now I receive the full force of her compassionate intention. Now would I have given the treasures of the East had I seen her years ago. What a different man should I have been. In faith, John died. He spent the night before his execution in prayer. He went calmly to the scaffold and the power of faith which had come to him by putting his trust in Christ's words, he said. He wrote, laying all my past sins at the foot of the cross, Christ would in no wise cast me out. That's the power of pardon and forgiveness and peace when we encounter the living Jesus. Are you struggling in an area of sin? Are you like the woman of Capernaum, sick of it all, sick of yourself, sick of that sin? Then lay your sins at the foot of the cross of Jesus. By doing so, Jesus will wipe away those sins from the book of life. Five weeks ago, we were challenged to see Jesus as the one the Redeemer. Four weeks ago, we were challenged to wait upon God. Three weeks ago, we were challenged to shut the door on the devil. Two weeks ago, we were challenged to love all people. And last week, we were challenged to have faith. And this week, we are challenged to come to the cross with our sins. Remember what Paul wrote in Romans 6 verse 18. You have been set free from sin. This is the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. He has come to help us overcome. Oh, our culture is pretty tough out there. It's hard. And I reckon ministering to, to youth and to, and to students at schools, at, at university, that's so hard because there, there are just so many wrong messages and confusing messages out there. The culture of the world is different to the culture of true Christianity. Whatever walks of life we come from, Jesus calls us to a lifestyle that is counterculture and honours Him. And the, and the Apostle Paul, he knew this and so he wrote this message for the church and for us as Christians about culture, he said in Romans 12 verse 2, and I'm reading from the message here, he said, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. 
readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-informed maturity in you. Sometimes we as Christians, we as Christians become too well adjusted to the culture around us that nothing sometimes can distinguish us from that culture. It's into this culture that we receive such confusing messages. And aren't there so many confusing messages going around social media and and television and so on these days that many of us can fall into temptation and our faith starts to struggle. Paul says, instead, fix your attention on God. This woman from Capernaum, she sought Jesus out. I think she was sick of it all, sick of her life. And she had heard something about this Jesus. And so she came to him in faith and did something so counterculture. Paul also says, you will be changed from the inside out. And that's what the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit does. He can change us if we decide to be counterculture and fix our attention on God and His ways as described in His holy word. In fact, Paul says in verse 2, unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I reckon every single one of us can get dragged down by the culture of this world. That's the aim of the evil one. But Jesus has come. And he has died on the cross for us, forgiving us for what we have done. But we are, we are to repent. We are to be sick of what we have done and who we've become. We are to fix our attention on the most holy God. And when we do in faith, God will start to bring out the best in us. Jesus did this for the woman of Capernaum. He did it for Jody. He did it for John. He did it for me. Boy, did he do it for me. And he will do it for you. That's the encounter that we can have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, thank you for the gospel yet again. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, of when we have this encounter with you, Lord, that our past Our sins can be wiped away, ready for a new life. But that takes a step of faith. It takes a decisive decision that I've got to do something about this. And so, Lord, I pray for any person here, Lord. And we are all sinners. We've all fallen short of your glorious standard, as it says in Romans. I just pray, Father God, that... For those here that are just struggling, Lord, that keeps tripping over their sins, Lord, help them by the power of your Holy Spirit to come to the foot of your cross where you have dealt with the penalty of our sins. And I pray, Lord, through this encounter with you, Lord, that you'll start to lift that burden that they are carrying, carrying, Lord. And I pray, Father God, that they too will experience your forgiveness And they too will experience your peace, your peace that transcends all of our understanding. Lord, may we all experience this peace. And so, Father God, thank you for this encounter that this woman had with Jesus and what it means for us today. May you help us not just to see it as a nice story, Lord, but a story that continues to have impact upon each of our lives. Thank you again for your love and grace. Help us to fix our attention on you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.